Good afternoon, everyone. I am delighted to welcome you to today's webinar, Suicide Prevention Strategies for Organizations Working with Children, Youth, and Families. Thank you so much for joining us today. Before we get started, I'd like to share three logistical notes. First, both American Sign Language and Spanish Interpretation are available for this webinar. You can select this option through the interpretation icon at the bottom of the Zoom window. You can also turn on the live captioning. Second, please note that the chat is open for this webinar, so feel free to use the chat feature to ask questions or share resources. Lastly, next week, you can expect to receive presentation slides, a link to the event recording, and additional resources sent to you via email. We are so excited to host this webinar today, which is World Suicide Prevention Day, an international observance celebrated annually on today, September 10th. September, in case you didn't know, is Suicide Prevention Month. It's a time to remember the lives lost to suicide, acknowledge the millions more who have experienced suicidal thoughts, and the many individuals, families, and communities who've been impacted by suicide. It's really also a time to raise awareness about suicide prevention and share messages of hope with each other. Today, our expert panel will focus on deepening our understanding of suicide data as well as risk and protective factors for children and youth. We will discuss strategies for preventing suicide and hear from leaders in the field on successful efforts they are leading in their own communities. I am Dr. Santana Dean, and I serve as the Director for the Division of Runaway and Homeless Youth in the Family and Youth Services Bureau here at the Administration for Children and Families, or ACF. ACF is a part of the Department of Health and Human Services, we're really charged with promoting the economic and social well being of families, children, individuals, and communities. The Family and Youth Services Bureau, which is where I sit, supports organizations that promote youth well being, prevent and end homelessness, as well as support a holistic adolescent approach by fostering collaborative partnerships across communities and leading in partnership with youth and young adults. The Runaway and Homeless Youth Program in the Family Youth Services Bureau serves as the national leader in the provision of temporary emergency and long-term shelter and comprehensive supportive services to youth who have run away, are experiencing homelessness, or housing instability. I'm truly thrilled to be here with you today and encourage you all to visit our website to learn more about programs within the Family Youth Services Bureau. I'd like to now introduce you to Brandon Johnson, who is the branch chief of the Suicide Prevention Branch at the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, or SAMHSA, which is a sister agency to ACF within the Department of Health and Human Services. Brandon, you can take it from here. Thank you so much. And I wanna say thank you for that. Um, warm welcome, uh, Dr. Dean. We appreciate you, you being on in this partnership uh, with SAMHSA and, and ACF. So hello everyone, I'm Brandon Johnson. I'm the branch chief of the Suicide Prevention Branch uh, here at SAMHSA. Uh, SAMHSA is the agency within the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services that leads the public health efforts to advance the behavioral health of our nation. And so we are incredibly excited and we are a part of the Suicide Prevention Branch, which sits in the Center for Mental Health Services. And this is where um, the majority of our suicide prevention activities take place uh, within, within SAMHSA. We are incredibly excited to be here today to have this conversation. Um, we really want to prioritize this as a part of Suicide Prevention Month and World Suicide Prevention Day. Um, as a part of this, we are collaborating with our, our friends at ACF uh, for a number of reasons, but our, our mission is truly do align in supporting uh, youth and families uh, across the nation. I do want to also take this time to quickly mention um, that in uh, April of this year, the National Strategy for Suicide Prevention was released um, as a part of uh, from HHS and also a partnership with the White House. Um, I encourage you all, as you are taking in information today, um, to take a look at the National Strategy for Suicide Prevention. Um, it is at hhs.gov slash NSSP. Uh, within uh, that document, Strategic Direction 1 really focuses on uh, community-based suicide prevention. And there's a host of information that would be uh, incredibly useful to you all as you all are engaging with youth, uh, children, and their families, as well as the first ever Strategic Direction on health equity and suicide prevention, along with the national strategy released alongside it 
was a federal action plan uh, that includes over 200 federal agencies, uh, I mean, 200 uh, federal action items across a number of federal departments and agencies uh, with commitments to address suicide prevention um, across the country. Um, and as a part of that, this collaboration is really birthed from a federal action plan item um, that SAMHSA and ACF put forward together. Um, so we are excited to have this conversation today. Um, you will be hearing from a number of amazing experts. Please interact with them, put things in the, in the chat. It's amazing to see so many people um, on and sharing where they're from um, in the chat. I also see some familiar names in the chat um, as well, but we are so excited to have you here. Um, and with that, I am going to turn things over to uh, Katie Deal, with the, who's a part of the suicide prevention branch. She's a public health advisor there, uh, where she works across a number of suicide prevention grantees um, and supports the work from the 2024 National Strategy for Suicide Prevention. Um, Katie's been in this space for, uh, for over 20 years. And beyond that, she's just an amazing person to work with, with a ton of knowledge and experience in this, uh, in this field and in this realm. And so I'm excited and honored to turn uh, the webinar over to Katie. Hi, everyone. I am so, so happy to be here. Um, thank you, ACF, for inviting SAMHSA to be part of this. And I see the chat just blowing up. Hello, howdy, aloha, how you doing? How y'all doing? It is so good to see you all here, whether it's afternoon, morning, maybe early morning in Hawaii. Um, just so, so grateful um, to have you be here and, and showing up for suicide prevention. It is World Suicide Prevention Day. That puts a big smile on my face. Um, and just happy to be sharing a little bit of kind of context setting for you all before we get into a fireside chat of amazing with me, amazing panelists in a little bit. So this is going to be pretty quick. Please type in questions, comments, anything along the way. Um, and we will have also some time for Q&A later on in this webinar. Um, the slides will be available to you and a recording will be available to you afterwards. I also want to um, give a big shout out to my suicide prevention branch colleague, Erin Atwater, for her help with the slides um, that I'll be going through today. Next slide. Okay, so um, you see a disclaimer here, kind of standard issue, but I also just want to share um, that we're discussing a very difficult topic. You see a big smile on my face because that's how much I believe in prevention. I'm excited that we're here talking about this, but this is a really difficult topic to be talking about, and it, um, it might be a bit triggering for folks. So I just want to say that if at any point you need to step away turn the webinar off, come back to this topic later. It will be recorded if you need to come back to it at another time. Um, and also just let you know about um, the 988 suicide um, and crisis lifeline. Um, and so we'll put a link to that. I, I'd love if Erin if or Brandon could put a link to that in the chat. Um, so just a, a reminder to be taking care of yourself first, you know, the whole adage about when you get on an airplane um, as we talk about this tough topic together. Next slide. Quick overview of what I'm going to be talking about in the next few minutes. So first half a bit on understanding suicide. Um, some of you may be kind of fully immersed in this topic. Some of you may be newer. So I'll just do kind of a, a quick review of some of the data on suicide, suicide attempts, suicide plans, and suicide ideation or thoughts. What are the risk and protective factors for suicide among children and youth? And warning signs, which can indicate kind of more imminent risk of, of suicide. And then transition into suicide prevention. How do we know where to kind of find prevention strategies and approaches to either kind of layer on to what you're already doing in this space or to help you get going if you're new at a suicide prevention and also share some examples of um, prevention strategies and approaches. I'm not going to be able to go over everything in 20 minutes, but just kind of high level to kind of get the wheels turning before we get into a panel who are going to tell you about the great work that they're doing in this space. Next slide. All right, so we know from the data that suicide is a very significant public health problem for all ages. Um, and this slide is about um, death by suicide. Um, this is data from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention or CDC, along with that national strategy that Brandon uh, mentioned a moment ago. So when we're talking about youth and young adults in this age range of 10 to 24, um, that's where about 15% of all deaths by suicide in the U.S. occur. There are about 49,000, 50,000 deaths by suicide each year. About 15% of those 
or among this group of, of folks. Second, suicide is also the second leading uh, cause of death. If you wouldn't mind going back a slide, Alyssa, uh, second leading cause of death. And there's also been a really sharp increase in youth suicide over the last two decades, about 52%. And that um, is higher than the general population um, trend of about 35, 36%. Next slide. More data here from CDC, this time on um, suicidal behavior, so that suicide attempts and uh, suicidal thoughts. Um, we uh, see from uh, the CDC data that we're also seeing worsening levels um, of suicidal uh, thoughts and behaviors in addition to the death data trends that I showed you in the last slide. So you see a couple data points here showing us uh, for the most recent data um, in CDC's Youth Risk Behavior su uh, Survey that about 9% of youth um, surveyed have attempted suicide one or more times in the past year, and about 20% of them seriously considered attempting suicide. Next slide. Scary slide, I know, because there's so much on it. I just want to point out what's in the orange box. So this is some, sa some SAMHSA data um, from uh, 2023 as well. So this is from our national survey on drug use on health that's, that SAMHSA administers. And this is for adolescents ages 12 to 17. And I just wanna go like kind of zoom in on that orange box and highlight a couple of data points from uh, that survey report. About 3 million adolescents had serious thoughts of suicide in the past year. Um, about a million and a half adolescents made suicide plans and about 850,000 had um, made a suicide attempt. Due to underreporting, these are likely conservative numbers, and that's true for the CDC data that I showed you as well. Next slide. I want to talk just a minute about health disparities um, in the data. So these are just a few examples of um, kind of subgroups of youth and children who are disproportionately impacted by suicide. And what that means is that they are experiencing suicide or suicidal behavior at higher rates than other youth. So for example, American Indian and Alaska Native youth had the most are the most significantly impacted by suicide. Um, for Black youth, there has been a really um, sharp increase in suicide rates among non-Hispanic Black youth. Uh, between 1999 and 2018, there was an 87% increase um, in suicide among Black youth, um, which actually is one of the reasons we now have at SAMHSA um, a Black Youth Suicide Prevention Initiative. Um, another example is youth living in rural areas. So this, the rate of suicide among rural youth in the 15 to 19 age uh, range is actually about 50% higher than urban counterparts. And then among youth experiencing homelessness, um, we have some data from CDC showing us that students who experienced unstable housing were about twice as likely to have seriously considered suicide and more than three times as likely to have uh, attempted suicide in the last year. So these are just a few examples. There's also some intersectionality among these groups. So for example, LGBTQ youth are overrepresented among people experiencing housing instability or homelessness. So there is some intersection there. And among kind of that intersection of youth, um, there's an even higher um, increase in suicidality. Um, next slide, please. So what we know from the research is that suicide, it's really complex and it's influenced by a lot of interconnected risk and protective factors at the different levels that you see in this social ecological model on the screen, kind of from the individual level all the way up to the societal level. There are different factors going on that may increase or decrease an individual's risk of suicide. These are not causal relationships. So for example, one risk factor is um, untreated mental illness, that's not necessarily a causal relationship. It just means that untreated mental illness puts you at a greater risk of suicide than if that wasn't the case. On the next slide, I'm just going to warn you, it's busy. I'm sorry. It's one of those slides that I personally hate, but I'm trying to do this quickly. So on the next slide, um, if you wouldn't mind, Alyssa, going on, I have some examples of what these risk and protective factors are um, in the literature among youth and young adults and children. So for example, adverse uh, childhood experiences, I'm sure a lot of you or most of you have heard of ACEs. So things like childhood trauma, child maltreatment, um, 
sexual assault, things like that, um, financial stressors in the home um, are examples. Negative life stress, like um, being involved in the juvenile justice system is another risk factor, um, behavioral health, health challenges. But then we also have protective factors on each of these levels as well that would kind of buffer that risk or decrease risk of suicide. Things like um, coping and problem solving skills, um, which not only reduce your risk of suicide, but also um, reduce your risk of, of other adverse um, events. On the relationship level, kind of that second bubble in the model, um, some examples include negative relationships um, where there might be um, bullying or social isolation, for example. Negative life, event, uh, negative life events like a loss of a loved one or a loved one's suicide. Um, but protect, you know, again, on that kind of protective side of the coin, um, we know that connectedness is a, is a really fantastic um, kind of strong protective factor against suicide. Things like social support and connectedness with um, having cl close relationships with very positive people, whether um, that's peers or family members or what have you. Um, at the community level, we see things like a traumatic history, historical trauma, a suicide cluster in a community, being in a high-risk environment where there might be a greater um, rate of community violence, for example. Um, again, on the protective side, being part of a healthy environment where you have access to affordable and culturally appropriate healthcare, for example, can really buffer that risk and kind of back on the con connectedness thread, connectedness to community and social institutions. Um, so the list goes on kind of at all these different levels. And I would love, if you wouldn't mind typing in the chat, whether you consider yourself working in suicide prevention already or not, which of these, if any, risk and protective factors are you already addressing in your work? Are you already doing work to um, support people who have, to support youth who have experienced negative life events or who are, um, have been part of the juvenile justice system, or you're working to um, provide more connectedness um, within your schools uh, between students and teachers and community members, for example. I see connectedness piping in, feel at connection, coping and problem solving skills. You may not even know <laughs> that that is suicide prevention already. You're already in this space, whether you think you are or not. So that's fantastic to hear. Um, and I also, again, this is another area where there's um, some kind of intersection as well um, to be thinking about among kind of different uh, groups of youth. And the social ecological model that I had up on the last slide, it suggests kind of given the complexity of factors that you see here, that preventing suicide really requires multiple kind of simultaneous action across multiple levels of risk and protection fact of among the individual relationship community and societal levels. Next slide. So the factors that I just described are things that we know through research to increase or decrease risk of suicide. Um, people who are considering suicide may also show signs that are that they're thinking about or planning to attempt suicide, and these are called warning signs. These suggest that there may be more imminent risk or danger um, um, for that individual. And SAMHSA's uh, suicide prevention uh, website, which I've linked in the resources section, does have a list of warning signs for youth, which I've listed here, as well as one for adults, if you want to go look up the one for adults. And um, again, I, I want to point out that there might be some kind of differences here among different groups of youth in terms of how warning signs are presented. So for example, Black youth are less likely to express suicidal thoughts before making a suicide attempt because of the stigma surrounding suicide and mental health um, in that population and a distrust of the healthcare system, an understandable distrust. So you might see some variability in kind of the expression um, of these warning signs. Um, but again, I just want to point out that some behaviors may indicate that there may be an emergency happening or that a person is in crisis um, of harm to self or others. They might be planning an actual suicide attempt um, and acting erratically. And that if you ever see um, or hear any of these behaviors being exhibited, um, that's when to kind of immediately connect that person to crisis support, such as the 988 suicide and crisis life lifeline or emergency services. And SAMHSA funds the 988 
um, line to provide 24 seven help to folks. And if you click, we will be sharing these slides. And if you click on the picture on the slide, it takes you right to the website um, to learn more about 80, to learn more about 988. Next slide. Okay. Let's get into some good news. That's really tough stuff to hear. I know the data sometimes can be tough to hear um, and sometimes a, a downer because this is a significant problem. But the good news is we know through our research um, and from our practice that suicide can be prevented among children and youth and families. We know that we can intervene and provide crisis support and treatment to folks. And we know that we can help people recover and thrive. By the way, it's also National Recovery Month and SAMHSA has some great resources on that. Happy to send you more info um, along that route. Brandon mentioned um, in his opening remarks, this new national strategy for suicide prevention. Um, this strategy came out in 2024. It's got a great uh, kind of 10 year trajectory to it, very comprehensive. Um, and what I wanna highlight are just kind of a few key themes that, that I take away when I, when I read the strategy um, that are really, I think, very foundational to any kind of suicide prevention activities that we engage in. First is the, important of, the importance of forming partnerships with others. Suicide, as you can see with all those risk and protective factors, it's really complex. There are a lot of different variables that influence suicide risk, as I just went through, and that really warrants um, partnerships with different folks. And I'd also love to hear in the chat, if you are already working in the suicide prevention space, who are you partnering with? Um, it might be some kind of unexpected folks. It might be people with, you know, suicide-centered lived experience. It might be people working other kind of youth-serving systems, um, your data folks, families, that kind of thing. Um, so would really love if you want to chime in kind of who you're partnering with this or who you would like to partner with um, on this issue so that you can kind of maximize your resources and have an even kind of greater impact. Um, next is kind of how critical it is to strengthen your infrastructure and workforce capacity to the extent possible to have that really strong foundation for your prevention efforts. And then also to have the work you're doing be part of a strategic and comprehensive approach. Um, I'll share in the resources slide at the very end how you can find out what's happening in your state already for suicide prevention. Most states have their own strategic plan for suicide prevention. Many have a suicide prevention coalition at the state level and or at the kind of local or county levels that you could be part of um, and kind of engage in that kind of uh, strategic work. Um, and when I say strategic and comprehensive, what I really mean is that the work is informed by data and science as well as by lived experience and culture and includes a range of strategies. Next slide, please. So not to harp too much on strategic planning, um, but we know um, through our research that prevention of suicide um, efforts are most effective when they're guided by a strategic planning process. We at SAMHSA fund a great uh, resource center called the Suicide Prevention Resource Center or SPRC, and they're gonna be part of the fabulous panel in a few minutes. They have some really great resources. Um, and one of them is a set of resources on strategic planning. People understandably often want to go straight to step four. We have a problem. We want to do something about this. Let's go find some interventions that can help us solve this problem. And to the extent that your time and resources allow, we really encourage you to go through those first couple of steps if possible to, you know, to do things like using your data to understand how suicide affects your community, to be able to describe the problem more fully and the context. What are some of the risk and protective factors that are most salient for your populations of, at higher risk, for example? And to also, you know, take a minute and choose some long-term goals for your work and then to prioritize the key risk and protective factors that you want to address that are most salient for your community, state, tribe, what have you. All right, next slide. Back to that wonderful Suicide Prevention Resource Center, another one of their great resources is this comprehensive approach to suicide prevention. Um, again, we know that it's usually a comprehensive combo of strategies and interventions working synergistically that we need to have in place to address this complex issue. This tool from the SPRC lays out these nine strategies that come together to form a comprehensive approach. And each strategy, you can address them in different ways. There are different kind of specific 
practices and programs that you could use to advance those strategies. Um, but this is just kind of the big picture of the puzzle pieces that include some ups, kind of upstream, per, you know, uh, prevention uh, activities, you know, before folks are getting into the river, as it were, like um, strengthening resilience and teaching life skills, as well as some of the downstream efforts of um, uh, effective care and treatment of someone who's already suicidal, as well as engaging in postvention or aftercare um, efforts after some after there has been uh, a suicide in a community or other setting. Next slide, please. I want to take just a second to show you where you can find a whole plethora of evidence-based and best practices. So again, that national strategy for suicide prevention that Brandon and I have been talking about has a ton of examples um, woven throughout from community-based suicide prevention to crisis response and treatment to health equity, um, improving data and surveillance, things like that. The SPRC that I that I that we found at SAMHSA has a best practices registry with dozens and dozens of listings that have all been reviewed, and um, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, or the CDC, has a wonderful resource listed here that has um, that details strategies that have the best available evidence and examples of policies, programs, and practices that can help um, advance uh, those efforts. Next slide. Okay. So I'm gonna now give you a couple examples. I only have a few more minutes. I could be with you all week <laughs> and still probably not tell you, you know, all the different ways. When I started in this field, I could count on one hand the number of evidence-based strategies that we had in suicide prevention. And now we have dozens and dozens. So that's the really good news. Um, the field is growing. There's still a lot that we don't know, but I want to give you a couple examples um, that I pulled from the national strategy, and you can also find these in that best practices registry and CDC resource. One is about promoting healthy social connections. I, I saw a number of you in the chat saying you're working on connectedness. Sources of strength is one example of how you could um, utilize this strategy for um, kind of bolstering this protective factor and reducing suicide risk. This is a school, this is a school-based program. It promotes healthy social connectedness in school settings that can counter some of the suicide risk factors, such as feelings of loneliness, social isolation, mental health conditions, um, and bias, harassment, and discrimination. Has anyone seen the new, um, relatively new, it came out earlier this year, the Surgeon General's Advisory? on connectedness and, and loneliness. If not, we can put it in the chat for you. It's a fantastic um, resource um, uh, on the issue of social connectedness and, and loneliness um, in this country. This is an example of how improving social connectedness not only reduces suicide risk, but it helps across a whole host of other health issues as well. Um, another example of a suicide prevention kind of strategy is creating protective environments. So, for example, creating safe, supportive, and affirming environments for LGBTQ youth. That could be home environments, school environments, healthcare settings, public spaces. We know in the research now that that actually results in a range of positive outcomes that reduces suicidal behavior. And it also promotes positive youth development, which is a protective factor against suicide. Here's an example on the slide of how you could do that. Um, we know from the research that being involved in a gay straight alliance or a gender and sexuality alliance is a great way to do that. Even the, the presence of one of those in a school has a protective effect in terms of um, creating an environment, kind of back up, think back to that social ecological model. We're now going up to kind of that like community, societal level of the model um, and, and doing kind of an environmental approach here. Another example um, of creating protective environments would be um, implementing bullying prevention programs or violence prevention programs among schools or other youth serving environments um, across the community. Next slide. As I'm talking, by the way, if this is resonating with you in any particular way, yes, we're doing this too. Yes, it's working. Or, ooh, I hadn't thought of that. Maybe I want to try that, but I have a question. Use the chat. Um, 
So, you know, keep, keep typing in. Um, another example is teaching coping and problem solving skills. I saw a few, a few of you when we we're talking risk and protective factors that this is something that you're already addressing. This could include things like social emotional learning programs that we see a lot in schools like the good behavior game. Um, to reduce risk factors for suicide, like hopelessness and anxiety. Um, this is a, a, that particular program has been around for a number of years and has a, a really substantial research, uh, research base to it. Um, this also includes um, programs for parents and caregivers and families um, to teach them coping and problem solving skills that helps not only the parents, but their children and youth in their homes as well. Um, another example is promoting lethal means safety. So we know there's a, a sizable um, uh, research base now showing us that suicide rates decline when access to highly lethal means of suicide are reduced, like you know, firearms, opioids, um, various uh, means that are used for um, uh, suicide attempts. This could you could work on this through you know PSAs, education for healthcare providers, partnering with gun uh, retailers, safe storage during times of heightened risk, etc. Next slide. Two more examples that I want to close with. Um, one is on you know, kind of thinking back to those uh, warning signs that I talked about a few slides ago. Um, the next example is about identifying folks, children, youth, and families who are at heightened risk of suicide and might be exhibiting some of those signs. There are um, things like gatekeeper trainings, um, kind of approaches such as gatekeeper trainings, which um, can help non-clinicians, so folks who are not mental health clinicians. It can help folks like teachers, juvenile justice staff, um, family members to be able to recognize and respond to any sign, uh, warning signs of suicide and, and know what to do, how to help a child or a youth, for example, who may be exhibiting those signs um, or and kind of be at heightened risk. Um, and there are you know, various types of trainings and I know some of our panelists are gonna get into those. Lastly, I just wanna highlight a SAMHSA grant program that's included in the National Astrology, the Native, uh, the Native Connections uh, Program. Um, this is a community-based a suicide prevention program that focuses on various youth outcomes for American Indian Alaska Native youth. Um, it's grounded in traditional indigenous family structure and it, and it addresses um, several different uh, suicide prevention uh, or suicide risk factors, excuse me. Next slide, I'm just hustling along for time. References, just a little light reading for anyone who wants to dig deeper. And I'm gonna close here. Um, thank you for letting me have a few minutes on the floor and I'll be back in for the Q&A. Hi everybody, we're going to move to the um, panel discussion portion of today's webinar. Um, my name is Cheryl Healy. I'm a senior policy advisor with the Administration for Children and Families. Uh, focused specifically on behavioral health here at ACF. Um, and I just first want to say we have over a thousand folks on the webinar today, and we just want to thank you for the work you are already doing in this space and for your interest in engaging on this important topic. I'm joined today by three wonderful panelists to have a conversation about how they are doing suicide prevention work and to discuss advice they have on how we might get started or deepen work in this area. And we've tried to have a mixture in terms of the panel of folks representing different types of organizations, recognizing that there's really a role for everyone to play in suicide prevention, even if it's not the you know, core mission or focus of your organization. So I'm joined today by Donna Golub, who's the executive, executive director of A Positive Approach to Teen Health, Summer Albert, a prevention specialist with the Suicide Prevention Resource Center, and Stephanie Bush, from the injury, the injury Prevention Manager at the Vermont Department of Public Health. Each of our panelists come at this work from a different role and type of organization, and we are so grateful for their participation in today's webinar. So with that, I will ask each panelist to briefly introduce themselves, their organization, and how they think about suicide prevention in the context of their work. And Donna, I will have you kick us off. Good afternoon, and thank you again for having me. As mentioned, I'm Donna Golub, and I'm the Executive Director for PATH, a Positive Approach to Teen Health. And we are grantees under ACF's Adolescent Pregnancy Teen Prevention 
program. Um, you might wonder exactly how teen pregnancy and suicide awareness ended up connecting. And I'm looking forward to sharing with you a little bit about how and why we did that. Um, I think I'll just end there and wait for my next question so I don't get carried away. <laughs> Thank you, Donna. I will pass it to Stephanie to introduce herself next. Hi, everyone. Thank you for spending your time, and I hope you're getting to enjoy some of the last days of summer. My name is Stephanie Bush. I use she, her pronouns. I work at the um, Vermont Department of Health. It's a statewide public health entity, um, and we are also, or so we are grantees of SAMHSA for youth suicide prevention, also CDC um, comprehensive suicide prevention, which I'll talk about a little bit more. Um, really excited to talk to everybody, and I think one of the things um, specifically is I really like to work across disciplines since, you know, a couple of people have mentioned we all have a part to play around suicide prevention, um, both upstream, downstream, and all of that. So excited to talk more. Thank you, Stephanie. Summer, do you want to round out the introductions? Yeah, thank you so much. Hi, everyone. My name is Summer Albert. I use she, her pronouns, and I'm one of the prevention specialists at the Suicide Prevention Resource Center. We are a federally funded and supported resource center really devoted to implementing and really helping states, territories, and local communities implement the National Strategy for Suicide Prevention, which you heard about earlier, and we are funded also by a grant from SAMHSA, and I am very excited just to share some of our resources, some of the tools and strategies we've been using, and really just sharing some of the really great work that states and communities that we work with have been doing. Thank you all for introducing yourselves and, you know, hopefully for, for the audience, you know, I think helpful to have kind of the perspective of somebody sitting in the state seat, you know, someone who's leading an organization whose core work is really not focused on suicide prevention, but is passionate about, you know, doing what they can within the context of the work they are doing. And of course, somebody who's sitting in the seat of a technical assistance center providing, you know, expertise to the field on this important topic. One of the things that Katie mentioned in her presentation is you know, the importance wherever possible to really not um, jump just to something really specific that you can do on suicide prevention, but to really take a step back and think about what the data is telling you, what's driving suicide risk in your community, and then making a more holistic kind of plan to approach that. So with that um, point in mind, I wanted to ask our panelists to talk a little bit about the goals and key activities that your organization has around suicide prevention for youth. And Stephanie, I'll start with you. Oh man, I was just thinking like the goals of my organization is to improve health for the entire state of Vermont. Um, so it starts with a very wide breath. Um, but yeah, so some of the ways that we've looked at um, both our goals and activities around kind of the youth suicide prevention focus is actually really looking at our data. As a public health person, we love to inform um, our work with data, evidence-based strategies. I know that those re resources have already been mentioned. Um, and I'll put into the chat, one of the things that we've done recently, which was really amazing, was take a success that we had around our social autopsy. So looking at everyone that died from an opiate overdose, where did our systems engage? Where did they touch them prior to um, them passing away? And we took that framework and looked at suicide, both morbidity and mortality, for opportunities for um, new partners, new areas for interventions. And that really helped to inform um, and kind of pull in people that maybe weren't uh, necessarily enthusiastic about engaging in the conversation to be like, hey, just so you know, um, I was looking at 45% of people that died from by suicide had a known crisis within two weeks of their death. How do we engage in that conversation? Who are they, like, how do we help connect that person to support? How do we, um, improve help seeking along with that. And so uh, we like a lot of data. Um, and also one thing I'll also mention too is um, engaging with the Suicide Prevention Coalition that we have within our state to say what's already happening. We don't need to reinvent the wheel. Let's improve the wheel. Do we need a second wheel to help things move along maybe? Um, but really looking at uh, kind of what work is already being done, who are the players and what is our data telling us? Thanks, Stephanie. And I love that emphasis on, you know, how you're letting the data really guide and drive the conversation and then leveraging what's already in place and going 
um, in the communities you're working with to, you know, as you said, not reinvent the wheel, but improve it or, or make it um, go faster, or work better. Um, Summer, I'll turn to you next. I think I want to oh. jump on, sorry, I, this is an important point. So yes, data is important. Um, what is it telling us? And also where are those areas of readiness? So I can say, this is the top thing. It's going to make everything better. But if that area, that sector doesn't have the readiness, then how can we build those relationships? Sorry, I just like key component. No, it's a great thing to emphasize. Um, Summer, I'll turn to you next to um, see what you would say about SPRC's strategy and goals in this area. Yeah, of course. And before I start, I just want to echo um, Stephanie's point about relationships. I think that is the key to a lot of this work is really building those sustainable relationships to really not only understand, of course, suicide prevention and suicide as a full public health issue, but really understanding what are folks' cultural understandings, what are folks' cultural beliefs, and how can you really tap into that readiness and help support folks. And related to that, SPRC is really all about advancing suicide prevention infrastructure and capacity through a variety of different things. We provide consultation to states, territories, communities, and healthcare systems. We have a host of different free resources on our website. A couple of folks have talked about the best practices registry. So an entire online, empirically supported, and community-supported evidence-based practice of all of those different community-based suicide prevention initiatives, as well as a variety of interactive online trainings. And we're really guided by three main goals. One, to really strengthen health, behavioral health, and clinical workforces to screen, assess, and treat effectively folks that are interacting with these systems to really make sure we're reducing both suicide death and attempts. So really making sure that, of course, we're not only assessing for these things, but really getting to the heart of why folks are experiencing suicidal crises, why are folks dying by suicide. Second, we really work to expand capacity in state, tribal, and community systems to really implement some of those evidence-based strategies strategies we've been talking about. That's the, where the majority of my work falls. I have a small portfolio of states that I really work with to think through what are you doing in terms of suicide prevention? Do you have the staff time? Do you have the funding? Are you selecting the right strategies for the populations you wish to impact? And then of course, our third goal is we really focus on building a robust public-private partnership across sectors to advance suicide prevention policy. A lot of folks have already talked about the importance of partnerships. So really thinking about what work is happening in the private space, what work is happening in the public space, and how can we, as a national organization, work to bring all of those together through our National Action Alliance for Suicide Prevention, and also how can the national level, of course, work to help implement some of those recommendations at the local level. And just like another plug for the national strategy, one really great um, aspect of this new national strategy is also the federal action plan. So of course, not only looking at states and territories and communities to do this work, but also understanding how our federal organizations and more of those national entities also working to push the needle on suicide. Thank you, Summer. And I'll just add, I noticed in the chat when folks were introducing themselves that we had a couple people joining from tribes or tribal serving organizations. And I know that SPRC also does significant work um, in that area as well. So just wanted to flag that for folks um, who may have a specific interest there. Um, I will now turn to Donna. And Donna, I'm excited to hear you talk about your goals and activities, and in particular, because you really wear a little bit of a, a different hat than some of our other panelists, and one that I think uh, will resonate with a lot of the folks on today's webinar, which is, as you well know, you know, path suicide prevention is not your, your core mission, but it is something you're passionate about doing. So would also, if you're willing to share just a little bit about how you got going in this area, what prompted the, the interest in doing some suicide prevention work um, would be, I think that would be a great benefit to the audience today. Yeah, I, I was gonna start with that very thing, a little different hat because um, PATH is a small community nonprofit organization. And um, our focus has always been around adolescent pregnancy prevention and then all of the things that went, that go with that but what we realized a few years ago, and it actually probably started a year before COVID, was that um, we were talking to a lot of youth who were really struggling emotionally and mentally. And we were getting calls as an organization from parents and schools saying, what do you have? How can you help us? 
And in that same period, um, I had a lived experience with um, my granddaughter and my niece, both, both experiencing um, emotional and mental health crisis with some suicidal ideations. And it was kind of at that point that I thought, okay, this is a subject that is not talked about enough. And when it is, there's so much judgment, which is why I love 98's theme this year is no judgment, right? Just help. And I think that's so important. And so as an organization, we began to brainstorm how we could add this component into our programming. And was it a mission stretch? And, and that really, you know, you don't want to chase the dollars and you don't want to do the whole mission creep thing as a nonprofit. But when you're talking about adolescent health, you know, we realized as an organization, we have to always come from a holistic health approach, whole person health. You know, these teens that we're working with are more than just physical beings. They are emotional, they're mental, they're spiritual, they're social, and their coping skills were leading them to, to many risk experiences and so we just decided as an organization that this was a natural fit for us, really. Um, we, we heard the outcry of our community and the youth that we were serving, and we wanted to step up and help. So the first thing I did was join the Suicide Awareness and Prevention Coalition in our county. Um, I got involved then with the state level on top of that. Um, I became a QPR, which is question per, per res, uh, question, persuade, refer, gatekeeper, and trainer. Um, and so I started there training staff in schools um, how to be gatekeepers and how to recognize the signs and um, to break the stigma and give a voice to these kids who didn't feel they had a voice. So um, that's kind of how it all started with us. Okay. Thank you, Donna. I think that's just so helpful for you know folk, folks to hear who are thinking about this field like such a, a big topic that you may know is important, but how do you kind of take those incremental steps um, to get involved? And as Katie referenced in her presentation in the first part, there's also lots of activities that are evidence-based for suicide prevention that you might be doing already for other reasons, right? And, and so kind of thinking about that is, as you think holistically about what it means to support suicide prevention within the context of your organization. Yes, we um, were definitely working on student connectivity and the um, coping skills so that they were having healthy coping skills to avoid risk behaviors in a broad scope and especially then around adolescent pregnancy. It was a very natural and easy fit as we worked with our schools. Back to what Stephanie and Summer both said, the relationship piece is so important. Making sure that you have ongoing communication with those that you're working with and serving and really meeting their needs. Thank you for sharing that. I um, wanted to not change topics too much, but get maybe a little bit more specific for folks who are really thinking about something that they can grab onto you and take away from today's webinar. So I was hoping each of you could talk a little bit about the types of supports that you found most helpful to you or your organization as you do this work. So that could be specific resources, um, specific partnerships, um, specific funding opportunities, and how you've sort of approached navigating those resources and, and sort of the steps you steps you took there. And I think specificity is is helpful here, um, given the, the types of organizations we have represented on today's call. Um, so Summer, perhaps I'll start with you and feel free, by the way, to also talk in your context about things that SPRC offers um, that you know might fit some of those needs as folks are looking to get started. Yeah, definitely. Like first I'll start with like things that really help my work. Of course, again, emphasizing that relationship piece, something that's been so important to me is the connections and relationships we at SPRC are able to develop not only with communities, but with state leads and with territorial leads, since those are the folks who are 
on the ground, interacting with folks day to day, and they're so tapped into their communities. They're leading their state suicide prevention coalitions. They're in person in their states, and they really have a strong handle on what's happening in their state, as well as how different national trends are changing regarding suicide prevention. So making sure we're always connected to state. So we host a variety of different state leave drop-in sessions where we just allow states to come and talk and share the things that they're currently experiencing. We host a variety of different community-led practices for different states and territories to kind of teach them and of course build up that suicide prevention capacity I was mentioning earlier. And in terms of some other things that have really been helpful is when you're thinking about things like suicide center lived experience is our lived experience advisory committee that we have that is made up of folks who have some site, some sort of suicide center lived experience, their perspectives on developing projects on really thinking through what is suicide prevention, what does it mean, how are we making sure that we're not only, of course, honoring those that we have lost, but how are we also honoring the folks who have provided support for these people? How are we honoring their lived experiences and making sure that their voices are really at the center of a lot of the programs and offerings that we offer at SPRC? So their guidance has been really important and key to a lot of the products we developed in terms of resources from SPRC that I think that will really help and guide folks in this work, of course, Katie did a really great job of highlighting that strategic planning approach to suicide prevention. So really walking through that, really understanding how we all oftentimes want to work on all those different little pieces in suicide prevention, but how to really think as a team, what are our key goals, what are those key risk and protective factors, and what are those strategies we can use? Of course, that best practice registry that I mentioned earlier. And one really great thing about the BPR is it also has community-based evidence. So as you all know, because of the disparities that exist in suicide prevention, sometimes it's really hard to get a researcher to write up a research question and come and have that traditional empirically supported evidence base. So we really took it upon ourselves to also allow entries into that registry that show community effectiveness. So what are some cultural adaptations to traditional programs that we can make? What are more inclusive metrics beyond the traditional, um, what you think of as traditional suicide prevention that we can be using? Then of course, we have a variety of different websites, um, sublinked for different populations on our website that I see folks have entered in the chat. And if at any point you are interested in connecting to your state leads in your state, I think someone also dropped the sprc.org slash states for all the different contact information to some of those state leads folks were talking about earlier. So you have a better idea of, does my state have a suicide prevention plan? What does it look like? How is it? matching up the national strategy, how can my organization maybe match up with their like state suicide led plan. So a variety of different resources. I'd be happy to also connect after this if folks are looking for anything specific. Thank you, Summer. And I really appreciate you highlighting in particular the best practices registry and the piece around kind of community um, endorsed and supported practices. I know one of the things we often hear from our grantees at ACF who are looking to do this work is being unsure of you know, are there specific, um, is there specific tailoring that should be done um, for particular communities, um, how to think about, you know, how risk factors might present differently in specific communities. So I know that those resources are, are so valuable um, to many of the organizations that we're interacting with. Um, Stephanie, I will turn to you next to ask you the same question in terms of um, resources and other tools uh, that you would either recommend for folks looking to get started or deepen in this area or ones that you guys actually used um, in Vermont to, to help you along your journey. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, so I was starting to put into the chat, I would say if you aren't already aware of your either state or local suicide prevention coalition, I would strongly encourage you to, to reach out typically really amazing people that are doing really great work. And it can be a really good opportunity to sometimes look at braided funding. So um, I'll use Vermont as an example. So we, so with our Garrett Lee Smith Youth Suicide Prevention Grant um, in thinking of reducing isolation, promoting social connections, using our YRBS data, which is uh, Youth Risk Behavior Surveillance, um data 
around understanding those like kind of upstream risk and protective factors, we really um, wanted to make sure that we were promoting safe spaces for um, youth who identify as LGBTQ, as well as helping support their families as well. So, and instead of us saying, hey, we're going to create this whole new program, we're going to engage all these people to come and do our thing. We're like, hey, why don't we reach out to our organizations that are already doing this? They're already engaging um, with that with the, the community, um, and with our uh, different division, uh, child and family services. They already engage a lot with children, um, family serving organizations, youth serving organizations. So we're like, hey, let's give you some money to give your grantees some money to continue to do awesome and amazing things. Um, also, we want you to do a bunch of big surveys. Sorry cross-site evaluations make me want to cry, but they're important. Um, so that's been really great of like looking at where are some of those gaps, where are those opportunities for braided funding? Um, and so it's not trying to come up with these new things. It's engaging, I'm imagining grantees like you all who are already doing this work, you already know your communities. Can we shift things around just a little bit to be able to, to get some funding to you and also um, to be able to kind of bolster the work you're already doing? Um, I also want to point out, because I haven't heard it yet, and I know it, a couple folks mentioned it, um, so we have a really strong and growing collaboration with the, um, not Vermont, uh, AFSP, American Foundation of Suicide Prevention, so we just did um, a project with them around uh, messaging with suicide with media folks, which was really great and amazing, but then also, which some folks were talking about, is um, around supporting families who have kids either that have past attempts or are struggling with suicide. Um, so really, how do we build up those support groups? I will find the link for that, but I think that might be one um, great opportunity for some folks really thinking about um, lived experience. People are kind of actively working and struggling with this and how to, um, how to actually uh, provide support for folks. And also, because it hasn't been mentioned as well, is thinking of the idea of postvention. Um, so how are we helping communities, organizations, uh, first responders? I'm also a first responder, uh, so advanced EMT volunteer on an ambulance um, after a suicide death, because we know that statistics, um, there's evidence that that increases uh, the risk, especially in Vermont. Um, we have about one degree of separation. Everybody knows everybody. So when there is a suicide death, it really can impact the entire state. Uh, so those are some really important resources that I would say, I would also mention if you're looking to try and do grant funding, the more our general strategy, which is I think why we've been successful with grants is um, working to incorporate evidence-based strategies instead of trying to like create your own wheel um, has made applications easier for us. And then we can adapt them as we need to. Um, I could talk about this forever, so I will stop now. No, thank you, Stephanie. And I think, you know, reflecting on what you all have shared so far, the key message is really, no matter what your starting point and kind of what you need, there are a lot of resources out there um, that can support people along different pieces of this, of this journey. And so for those who are not in this space already, or are just figure, trying to figure out how to get started, you're not alone and, and supports exist. And I know in the chat, folks have been asking if, if various resources will be shared. When we share the um, presentation from today and the recording, we will also share uh, probably what will be a very long list of um, some of the resources that were mentioned. So worry not if you're not um, capturing them um, as they're shared in the chat. And I will um, round us out with this question and send it over to Donna to talk a little bit. I know you mentioned um, question persuade refer training is something you you started with, but if there's anything specific that you would suggest, you know, folks who were past uh, however many years ago that we, we started in this work, um, kind of where did you look? Where would you suggest they, they might go first? Right, so um, as I mentioned, my first step was finding out what was available right where we were, because I didn't want to reinvent the wheel. That's not my background, it's not my specialty. So finding those evidence-based and research-driven, already successful that we knew would work was really important. So joining my local co coalition and then getting involved at the state level with AFSP, which um, Stephanie mentioned, and I know the link is in the chat there, was really important. That kind of gave me the foundation. And um, it was through my local 
um, county coalition that I was able to get both assist and QPR certified. They had funding available. The only thing I had to agree to was I was willing to teach those two things outside of my organization, right? Be a support to the coalition as well as to my organization. And I was more than happy to do that. Um, the next thing was then connecting at the school level and making sure that schools knew that the programming was available. So building again on those relationships, talking with school board members, talking with superintendents, talking with the school counselors, making sure that everybody was on the same page. And then how could we incorporate um, some of those evidence-based and theory-driven um, programs into what we were already doing? So we have um, a staff of educators that go into the school and do um, session in, in programmings in the schools. So um, first getting them trained, all of my staff are QPR trained, all of my staff are mental health first aid trained. So making sure that they had a good foundation and that they were well prepared to present the information to the schools and to youth were really important. Um, and then of course, allowing parents to know, hey, this is a tough subject, but it's something that needs to be talked about you know, we've heard from from the community that there's a need here. So making sure parents knew that we were coming and aware of when we were coming and kind of we provided them with an outline of what we were going to teach their youth so that they knew it. Um, the other thing was making sure that the days we were going into the schools to present programming was to make sure there were support staff on hand. Of all of the programming that we have taught over the years, we have gotten the most feedback from the students, the most students hang out after class with, you're talking about me today, or you're talking about my best friend and I don't know what to do. So having school counselors and the social workers on hand and ready for those immediate referrals is really key to making it successful. Because the last thing you wanna do is bring this information to the youth and then have no way to support them and get them the help that they need. So making sure that all of that, that support system is in place ahead of time is really, really important. Okay. Thank you for sharing that. I'm gonna to move to our last question before we move into the Q&A portion of today's webinar. So for folks who are um, joining today's webinar, if you have questions you'd like to see us at least attempt to address in the last 28 minutes, um, feel free to uh, put them in the chat now, and we, we also have been monitoring throughout. Um, but the last question I wanted to ask you all is really around um, what you've done or what you hope to do to center the voices of youth and families with lived experience in this area and really help it inform and drive um, the work that you are doing. So. Um, and or if you're sitting in more of a seat of a technical assistance provider, what you have seen others do or would suggest. Um, so with that, Stephanie, I'll start with you. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, so I would really encourage everyone, if you would like to uh, go to the Facing Suicide VT website, I can put the link in again. And um, one of the bars that are on the top is real stories. So when we really kicked off this and thinking about how can we reduce stigma around help seeking? How can we engage people so people, one, know how to recognize the signs for themselves or someone that they care about? Think about 98, which we can talk about later. Um, Vermonters want to hear from Vermonters. We want to see Vermonters that are sharing their stories of hope, of recovery, et cetera. And so on our webpage, we have um, real stories, which are Vermonters that have uh, suicide loss survivors, so someone that they loved. Um, died by suicide or even attempt survivors. And so really hearing their stories, um, promoting hope and thinking about safe messaging. Um, and we are working to expand it to include more uh, stories of hope and messaging of real Vermonters, which has been a big part. Um, the other piece, because I know I saw some people talking about it, we've actually steered away from using the term gatekeeper training because of our advisory committees that are like gatekeepers. Like, we all understand what that means, but it can be... Um, it can be a barrier, right? It's saying, I'm going to 
protect I'm, I'm gatekeeping this from you. Um, so we've really steered away from that because of our um, folks with lived experience that are like, this is not a great term to use. So um, lots of those things I will uh, will stop, but those have been really key components. Um, and if you check out our social media, um, you can see a bunch of our social media content that actually has those uh, real Vermonters that are sharing their stories. Thanks for sharing that, Stephanie. And I love the point, especially about the importance of getting community input, even on the language that's being used um, and then how we're framing some of the uh, best practices that are being implemented. Um, with that, Summer, I will turn to you to ask you the same question. Yeah, thanks so much. So I already mentioned our lived experience advisory committee. So they have been very instrumental. Almost every single project, resource, TA request that I get when I'm trying to incorporate like suicides in their lived experience. And I always pull in on their expertise and resources. One thing I will say when you are incorporating lived experience, I think this really kind of gets at that readiness that Stephanie was talking about earlier at the beginning of the panel. So really understanding what are you understand as suicide center lived experience? Do you currently have the skills and resources to actively convey, this is what safe and effective messaging for suicide prevention is. So a lot of the work that I currently do with states and territories is thinking through what are the resources you have to help folks. So if folks are coming to you after they've experienced a suicide loss and they wanna share their story, they wanna share resources, how are you preparing them? How are you offering them compassion and support, of course, for what they've been through, but how are you letting them know this is how you safely and effectively share your story. This is how you share your story in a way that is not re-traumatizing or re-triggering to yourself or to other folks that you're speaking with. Because at the end of the day, it is an art of storytelling, of course, and sharing our experiences. But also, we've been having a lot of conversations around how can we start centering and uplifting suicide center lived experience as expertise? Because oftentimes now it's still not seen as a form of expertise. So their lived experience and the things that they've been through and really making sure we're emphasizing all of those different um, protocols and procedures that they're recommending in our practices has been very helpful and effective. There's a lot of different resources also on our website in terms of how we made our lived experience advisory committee. We worked with a lot of different folks internationally and nationally as we started to make our advisory committee because it is really about taking the time to understand whose voices should be in the room. How can we make sure they're meaningfully incorporated? Of course, like not just coming at the beginning of the project or at the end of the project, how are we meaningfully incorporating their voices? So they've been offering us really great um, considerations in terms of health equity as well. So how are we making sure that we're acknowledging some of the disparities that exist in suicide prevention? So, and in terms of youth representation, one really great thing that I've seen a lot of states do is they have like youth advisory boards. So making sure that whenever you're having like a new suicide prevention program or maybe a screener that you're issuing to schools, making sure that we're actually asking youth, are we asking the right questions? does this make sense to you? Because oftentimes, of course, we all were youth at some point, but it's really important to always speak to that population that's currently experiencing these things. One really big initiative that we've been working on since the national strategy has came out is also understanding more about youth in social media. So speaking with youth, listening and understanding what they're going through, how are they using social media as a risk and a protective factor for suicide risk. Just to share an example, when we were developing the National Strategy for Suicide Prevention, we did have a series of different listening sessions and one of them was a youth listening session and just the breadth of knowledge and experience that the youth were able to share in terms of, this is what we're struggling with, especially after COVID and making sure that we're giving them the tools and the resources to of course, not only understand suicide, but actually making sure that our programs and our messaging is in a way that's interactive and safe and fun, but also is really catering to our specific audiences that we're working with. Thank you, Summer. I know we want to get to some Q&A. So Donna, I'll let you round us out with this question. Anything you haven't mentioned already uh, that you would add on this topic? Yeah, just um, one thing, maybe going back to a piece of from the other question is about the funding as a small nonprofit. We don't have money from SAMHSA and we don't have money from the state, you know, support around suicide prevention specific. 
but we wrote it right into our adolescent pregnancy prevention funding grant as two supplemental days of programming for our pregnancy prevention grant because of all of the survey results. So I, I, I never used to be a big survey person, but it drives so much of the work that we all are trying to do. And across the board, students were telling us when we said, what topics are we not hitting that you want to hear? Across the board, suicide was and mental health was the top of the list for three straight years. So, you know, are you going to hear them and give them the help that they're asking for or not? And, you know, that's kind of what I took to the board and to our grant writer when we decided to add that programming in and keep our fingers crossed, right, that they were going to fund that. And they did. You know, we just got new three-year funding that includes that two extra days of help. So um, you kind of got to think outside the box. You know, coping skills is a big part of suicide awareness and prevention. So it fits. Um, I also think, you know, the loss team, which is post-prevention, and post assistance is so important. I didn't know anything about that. Our coalition just started moving into that arena last year. Um, several of us have gone to the state AFSP training around lo the loss team and creating um, teams that can go in and talk to people who have lost someone um, by suicide and talk to them about their needs and resources for support and help because we know that, um, I think it was Summer was saying, those people are at even an, an increased risk for suicide themselves. So how are we helping them? And sometimes that's a forgotten group of people. Regarding um, the student voice, I've already said, we, you know, we added questions around suicide awareness and prevention to our surveys several years before we actually started incorporating program focus groups, we brought groups of eight to 10 kids in, fed them pizza and just talked about what's happening. What do you need to hear? How can we help you? How can we support you? What information do you want? What language works? What language doesn't work? So um, hearing them and then responding to them and not just checking it off as, okay, I did my support group. I did my, you know, I asked them my questions, but really hearing them and then as we created those two days of sessions, it, taking it back to them and saying, does this work? Does the, I mean, as simple as the colors, do the colors, are they welcoming? Are they inviting? Is what we're bringing engaging? Are we leaving you with more questions than answers? Is it too heavy? Is it too surface? Because we don't want to just scratch the surface either. So really hearing them and responding to what they say is important. Great. Right. Thank you, Donna. And thank you to all of the panelists. We'll now transition over to the Q&A portion of today's webinar, and I'll hand it off to Erin Atwaru, who's part of the Suicide Prevention Branch at SAMHSA, to facilitate. Hi, thank you. Um, thank you so much for letting me be a fly on the wall. I'm so excited to be here and just hear um, from our incredible uh, our incredible panelists today. So and we also have a ton of really fantastic questions coming in. So I'm gonna I'm gonna get us started. Um, there there are several questions in the chat, and this is really open for for anyone um, about kind of strategies for working in the intersection um, of uh, unhoused individuals or individuals who are experiencing homelessness and suicidal ideation and behavior. So I'm curious to hear if anyone's working in that space. Yeah, I can jump in here. I'm not currently, of course, doing this because I'm doing, of course, a lot of national work, but I have um, in the past. And one thing I will say about that is, of course, thankfully, the field of suicide prevention is moving more upstream. So really looking at those social determinants of health. So access to housing, access to things like medical care, food security, and all these different things. And a lot of states are starting to do a lot of great work 
not only partnering, of course, with housing organizations, with housing initiatives and alliances to make sure that they're having like specialized content related to suicide prevention for that specific population, but really working to understand how does housing instability and homelessness relate to suicide and how does it increase suicide risk? So really understanding, of course, like the shared risk and protective factors that being an, an individual who's experiencing homelessness shares, of course, with suicide risk. But really, I always encourage folks whenever they're looking at the more upstream to, again, don't try to reinvent the wheel. There's already a lot of really great like housing alliances and initiatives doing really great work. Um, one example that I will share is I know in Seattle, I think two years ago, they used to do this really great program called the Housing First Initiative. They really saw that, of course, folks need substance misuse training, they need access to health care, they need to eventually, of course, get employment, but at the end of the day, they need somewhere to live. So the Housing First Initiative essentially was they need to first have a stable, safe place to live before they can be involved in other programming. So they saw a lot of really great um, outcomes with that because folks were established. They're able to have that permanent address to apply for other things. So, so apply for government assistance to apply for jobs and education. So really just looking at the different examples that are available and are already out there and looking what are some ways and strategies I can adjust that for my population. Thank you, Summer. Thanks so much. I appreciate that. Um, I can move us to a new question or if anyone else wants to touch on um, housing. Okay. Um, really kind of uh, to piggyback off that, also strategies for um, working with individuals who are um, experiencing a disability of some sort. And really in particular, there was a lot of question, there were a lot of questions in the chat around um, um, individuals who are on the autism spectrum. And Katie put a really fantastic uh, resource in the chat, but I'm just wondering if we wanted to spend a little time talking about that. I can briefly say um, some of the work that we've really kind of focused on is around working to reduce stigma around mental health, accessing mental health, um, and building community and whatnot. So while um, I'm actually pulled that resource to look at it myself. Um, but thinking about, again, so our children and family um, health division engages a lot with different youth serving organizations and like children and family. Um, so really trying to build off of that idea around reducing isolation, um, building social connections, et cetera, um, and understanding like some of those kind of um, unique challenges and and thinking about the support groups uh for like family members or uh, parents um with kids who might be thinking like struggling with suicidal ideation and to kind of have like a more um building those kind of like uh lived experience those like local connections um, which works really well in vermont thank you stephanie does anyone else want to touch on that yeah, I'll just say that I think having that connection with your local or county state coalitions can really offer you the resources that maybe you can't afford to house locally, right? I know for us, we don't have the capacity for the social workers or the trained psychologist or whatever. So we really rely on our coalition and our partnership with them to get those resources when we're going. And I know um, maybe related, I saw a few comments in the chat about schools being understaffed or undertrained. And I don't think I even mentioned, I'm in Northwest Indiana and Indiana as a state has been very proactive around suicide awareness and prevention and require all licensed educators within the state, new um, people coming into the program with um, teaching our youth to have um, a QPR or similar training to, for part of their licensing. And in Indiana, anyone who works in a school district from the bus driver to the maintenance person to the cafeteria worker, they all receive QPR training. Um, that doesn't mean that they necessarily can save a life, right? Just if you consider CPR, we're all trained in CPR. The point is to provide the hope and keep them safe until you can get them to the expert, the physician or the psychiatrist. 
And I think that's important. You know, not every person has to be the expert. What we have to do for our kids is provide them with the hope and the resources they need to get them to the help that they need ultimately. And um, that's a role that anyone can play. Thank you, Donna. Donna, I'm so glad you mentioned that. And, and you know, we know in the research that oftentimes acute suicide risk, kind of the imminent risk, can sometimes be, a, a, it's often a pretty short amount of time. Um, so if we can kind of provide that connection and support and all of that, and that's why I mentioned in the um, in my slide about specific examples of prevention strategies and lethal means safety, it, it kind of you know, safe storage during those heightened periods, it's usually not a very long time. It might be minutes, hours even. So glad you mentioned that. I just wanted to also add, um, based off of some of the, the folks, um, who like the tribal communities, which also hasn't been mentioned. So the Bloomberg American Health Initiative is through Johns Hopkins. And I know that there's a several fellows. So I'm also a fellow. I was in the area of addiction and overdose because I like to wear multiple hats um, and just go all across all of the swim lanes. Um, but I know there are several fellows that are in the area of injury that and I don't remember if they're actually focusing on suicide prevention or not, but um, I can put the link in the the chat for like their overall website, but I know they've been doing some really amazing work around like engaging the, the tribal um, communities. And also their fellowship is currently open if you want to go and get your MPH or DRPH, because um, I'm sure everyone has all of the free time. Thank you, Stephanie. That's actually a really nice segue. Um... You know, we've we've also received a lot of questions around um, one of our attendees specifically said that they, their program targets immigrants and refugees, but um, also many other underserved communities and just wondering about any specific resources um, that they can tap into um, or strategies really for working with historically marginalized communities. So I, I'm actually going to jump in because I am I really appreciate someone uh, mentioned that. Um, and this is also a very reflective of who I am as a human. Um, so we have done some really amazing work with our local cultural brokers. So it's a, a group of five or seven um, former refugee and uh, new American, which I know is um, an outdated term, but I don't have a better one right this second. Um, and so with some of our overdose prevention work, we actually did some focus groups around um, opiate overdose, how to use Narcan, and basically like did these focus groups with these um, specific communities with interpreters or not um, around like, is this meaningful? What are questions, comments, concerns you have? And that was so successful. It was also extremely eye-opening for me that we are actually doing the exact same thing around suicide prevention um, awareness. So kind of like what we would call gatekeeper training. And we are actively working with uh, NAMI New Hampshire to adapt that training to each of those, um, to the, the community. And then um, once we figure out who owns the rights to the actual material, are gonna get it copyrighted and then it'll actually be available um, for, uh, I believe nationally, anyone that's trained as a, um, a train the trainer for it. So I'm happy to share that information, um, but it's super cool because with like um, Somali community, I believe Afghan community, Arabic speaking, French speaking, like Congolese, um, but it's been really amazing. And um, I have another grant coming that's focused on suicide prevention or um, overdose prevention. Where we're actually gonna have day long trainings around uh, like what to do in an emergency, calling 911 um, and all of those things and really going to take the opportunity of like, how can we do this? How can we deescalate in the moment, but have it be really community led. Um, it and it really started from building off of our department, um, our division of substance use and their relationship. And I was like, well, let's do this. Um, but it's been super cool and I'm like super excited about it. And I wish I had more time to like get it done right the second. Thank you, Stephanie. I appreciate that. Does anyone else want to speak to that before I move forward? Yeah, the only thing I'll briefly share is something I always encourage like the state student territories that I'm working with whenever they're working with folks who are disproportionately 
represented by suicide or folks who've been like historically underrepresented in this field is also just to learn like the history of the field and learn about the ways that folks have been victimized. Like what are the ways that the field hasn't showed up for folks who have been and still are at high risk for suicide. So you're coming into the conversation, understanding those dynamics, you're understanding you as a researcher, you as a clinician, like what is the power dynamic that exists there? What are some preconceived notions they may have? And really taking the time to call that out and to know that you're probably gonna make mistakes and to be aware of that and to really just don't, cause I think sometimes it's really, it's really easy in this work just to be like, oh, this one thing is so great and so amazing. It's gonna work for everyone and oftentimes it's not. So really taking the time to listen and consider the cultural perspectives, the lived experience and the ways different folks are understanding suicide. Just for a brief example, there are so many different tribal nations, for example, who don't have even a word to describe what suicide is. So when I'm speaking to tribal nations, talking about what is your relation to this death in terms of this is your community member. So of course not using the word suicide, but kind of getting into a conversation around loss and what does that look like and the supports that are needed. So really taking the time before you even approach those communities to learn a little bit of background about them. Of course, like Stephanie was mentioning, if you have the opportunity to work with a cultural broker and really just doing some of that background work, because it really helps just um, to break down some of those barriers, of course, bring some humility and personhood to the work that we're doing. Because at the end of the day, each culture, of course, has its own perspective when it comes to understanding suicide and suicide prevention. So in order to really have effective strategies for those groups, we really need to fully understand where they're coming from. Thank you, Summer. I appreciate that. Um, really quickly, we did receive um, a few questions also around um, Suicide prevention as it relates to bullying and violence prevention um, and what resources or strategies might be available in that regard. Yeah, I'm, this is Katie. I'm mindful of time. I, I will probably just put a few resources um, in the chat, um, but there are a number of um, evidence-based and best practices in bullying prevention and in violence prevention, where um, you could be looking at the goals and objectives of those types of programs and strategies and suicide mm -hmm. prevention goals and strategies and kind of work to align this. So happy to share um, more on that in, in follow-up. I think just kind of being mindful of time. But a lot of times there's there's a there's a, a lot of overlap and the CDC does have a really great resource on the risk and protective factors that are shared between violence and suicide prevention. That's actually where I would start. I'll put that in the chat. And then there are some specific kind of prevention programs and interventions where you can do some of that kind of, you know, kind of review and alignment of the goals and, and objectives between them. Yeah, that, that's exactly where in our programming, we've kind of added the suicide awareness and prevention piece is when we're talking about social media and bullying and all of that. It seemed to be a very natural place for it to kind of just flow because that's when we got a lot of questions. And we know that as we're working with um, many of our youth, that I, the social media and cyberbullying is so often. I don't think I don't think that anybody has made a solid line between suicidal ideation and bullying, especially cyberbullying. But there is definitely a very dotted line there. Thank you, Donna. Um I also want to be mindful of time. Do we have time for one more question or do we want to go ahead and we're going to go ahead and wrap up? Okay. All right. Well, then I'm going to hand it over to Katie. Thank you all so much. Um, I'll hand it to Katie to, to close us out. Thank you, Erin. And um, just want to highlight a few resources as we close. Um, I know we were sharing a bunch of resources in the chat as well. So I'm just going to kind of eyeball my ACF friends to see, I, I think we'll be kind of encapsulating all the resources that came up in the chat and sharing this slide deck and the webinar recording with everyone um, in about a week's time. Um, but a few resources that we wanted to share with you all, um, one kind of on the national level where you can find data sources on suicide, 
attempts, suicide plans, suicide ideation, and deaths by suicide um, that we've kind of mentioned throughout, um, along with strategy. So we've mentioned the national strategy several times, but also a link that um, that Summer mentioned and I put in the chat is where you can find out um, who's already working in suicide prevention in your state and whether there's a strategic plan for suicide prevention in your state. SPRC has a, a page for every single state and what's already shaken and bacon there. Um, and so that's where you can kind of go and, and learn more. And then the SPRC resource on engaging in strategic planning for suicide prevention. Next slide, please. A few more resources on specific prevention strategies and approaches that a lot of us have been mentioning uh, during the fireside chat, the Q&A and my presentation and where you can find more. Um, those, I also wanted to mention kind of from this, the SAMHSA perspective, we do have a page where you can go and see existing grant programs that are already in place and see if there are any near you where you might be able to connect with the folks working in this area, as well as a forecast of our notices um, of funding opportunities. Um, again, big plug for the SPRC. They have online trainings, they do webinars, you can request technical assistance, they have an online library, lots of good stuff there, a weekly newsletter, and then the, the 988 uh, Suicide uh, Prevention Lifeline. Uh, this, If you go to SAMHSA.gov, we also have a Suicide Prevention Month toolkit that we put out for the month of September um, and other resources on this topic. In closing, what I would love to do is just give you like a minute and you can do this in your head, you can type it in the chat, think about an aha moment, a question that's burning or like a take home, and then think about what's kind of one action that you think that you can take on this topic moving forward after today's webinar. Um, and the action might be to ask us another question. The action might be to call a potential partner. The action might be to go and review local data. Um, whatever that looks like, um, thank you again for joining us. Cheryl, is there anything that you want to say by way of closing? No, just echo thanks to everyone for joining. And we look forward to sending out the recording, the slides, um, the resources, as well as contact information for those willing to share um, to everybody who joined today in about a week or so. I want to jump in and just let people know that none of this is overnight. This is like in Vermont, this is seven years worth of work and building relationships. And so there's, there's often not something quick. Um, thinking about the next step you can do it can be amazing. And then also just letting people know that this topic can be super heavy. So go out and do something that makes you smile afterwards, whether it's enjoy the sun, pet a puppy dog, um, something that can make you feel good. <laughs>